cable television industry. What's so great about America is best-selling author Dinesh D'Souza's reaction to events of September 11. Next, Book TV catches up with the Hoover Research Scholar as he explains why he thinks America's critics, at home and abroad, are wrong and why America is, quote, the best life our world has to offer. It's 55 minutes. All right, everyone. We're going to get started with our next speaker. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dinesh, our next speaker. And by the way, if, if uh, I haven't met you yet, and I'm sure there's a lot of people in here who have not met yet, my name is Stefan Spath. I am uh, executive director at FEE. And uh, I'm so pleased to see so many faces here, and I hope you're all having a great time at the first uh, FEE annual convention. Um, we are just so pleased that it's going so well so far, and we hope you're all having a, a great time. Um, well, let's get started. Uh, our next speaker, Dinesh D'Souza, is the Rich Wayne Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He's also the FEE campus spokesman. And uh, Dinesh was a former White House policy analyst during the Reagan administration. He's also the author of best-selling books, including A Liberal Education, and one of my personal favorites, The End of Racism. And he also has his new book here with us today, which is What's So Great About America? And we have this, by the way, at our laissez-faire book stand in the exhibitors hall. And um, today, Dinesh is going to talk about uh, his book and other things. And so uh, please welcome Dinesh D'Souza. Thank you very much. Something very um, odd and important is, um, is going on in the Islamic world. We, um, we saw the terrorist attack of last year. We see the ongoing uh, turbulence in the Middle East. And one of the questions all of this raises is, what is this uh, fight all about? Uh, what is their beef with us? Uh, what is our beef, if any, with them? I think one reason that the terrorist attack surprised many people was it came at a time when the American idea seemed to be spreading irresistibly throughout the world. You could walk into a hotel in Barbados or Bombay and you would find that the bellhop was whistling the theme song from Titanic. But suddenly, many of us are acutely aware that there is fierce resistance to what America represents, and indeed to what Western civilization stands for in the world. And this fierce resistance, if one looks abroad, I can identify three main schools of anti-Americanism. Uh, the first school, I suppose one could call it the European school. I sometimes like to think of it as the French school. And uh, it is perhaps a school that is a little hard to take too seriously. The, the French critique often comes from somewhat effete males who carry handbags and so on. But, uh, but what the French seem to be saying is that the spread of American ideas and culture is annihilating what is local and distinctive about the other cultures of the world. And so, for example, you've got the French restaurant, uh, the French language, uh, that most precious of all creatures, the French intellectual. Uh, and the French view is that these things are being overrun uh, by that crass symbol, the, the golden arches of McDonald's. So this is the European uh, critique. Then you have the Asian critique. And the Asian critique, we see it in Singapore, we see it in Malaysia, uh, most importantly in China. And the Asian critique is that America and the West have solved the economic problem, but they have not solved the cultural problem. In the view of the Asian critics, America knows how to create prosperity, and it knows how to create technology, but it doesn't know how to create social order. And the Asian critics say, 
your crime rates are too high and your divorce rates are too high and your rates of illegitimacy are terrible and your public culture, your popular culture is often trivial if not vulgar. And they say, we think we can do better. We can combine economic prosperity on the one hand with social decency on the other. This is the Asian view. And then there is the Islamic critique. And the Islamic critique is most timely and relevant for our purposes because, in my view, behind the physical attack on the World Trade Center and on the Pentagon, there is an intellectual attack, an intellectual attack that we should be aware of and prepared to answer. And what the Islamic critics are saying, the most intelligent of them, is that everybody else in the world wants to selectively import America and the West. Everybody else in the world wants some part of Western civilization, but not the rest. And so, for example, look at China. It wants Western capitalism, but it doesn't want Western democracy. Or you look at the, look at the people in India, the Indian intellectuals in Calcutta and Bombay. They want Western technology, but they are ambivalent about Western culture. They want the internet, they want modems, they want cell phones but they're not so sure about Jerry Springer. But, but the Islamic view is that these efforts to selectively import Western civilization and America are an illusion. The Islamic view is you cannot selectively import America and the West. If you take some of it, you're going to get most of it, if not all of it. And if you get all of it, the effect would be very subversive to undermine faith in Allah, to transform a political and religious structures, to create a moral revolution in society, to leave the Islamic world unrecognizable from what it has been since the days of Muhammad. Now, the Islamic critics fear these things, and in fearing them, they are absolutely right. The idea of America and the West is a subversive idea in exactly the way that they say. And what I would like to do is very briefly outline what it is about the West and about America that is so subversive, that causes such palpitations and legitimate fears. Now, I'm going to begin by talking about Western civilization, and I begin with a puzzle. We live in a world that has been shaped and dominated by Western civilization to an unimaginable degree. Now, in some ways, this is a little surprising. If, if you come to my native country of India and you walk around, you see a couple of rather remarkable sights. First of all, you see tens of thousands of Indian males going to work in suits and sweating profusely. Why? Because the suit is, if I may say so, most ill-suited to the Indian climate. And then you go into the Indian uh, parliamentary buildings and you see uh, debates. And you go into the Indian courtrooms and you see dark-skinned guys in white wigs issuing verdicts. And you might say, well, this is the obvious legacy of colonialism. Well, yes, but the British left India in 1947. They left over a half a century ago. The Indians could easily have said, phew, the British have left. Let's take off these hot suits. Let's go back to traditional tribal native clothing. Let's forget about speaking English and all speak Hindustani. Let's go to the ancient panchayat system for resolving disputes. But the Indians did no such thing. Apparently, voluntarily, they said, let's continue to do a lot of stuff that was inflicted upon us by our captors. So I want to begin by asking, how is it the case that Western civilization has been, as it, for the last couple of hundred years now, the dominant civilization in the world? Historically, it was not so. If you go back in history, not that far, let's say to the year 1600. In the year 1600, the two most dominant civilizations in the world were the civilizations of China and the civilizations of the Arab Islamic world. They were the most dominant in wealth, in learning, in exploration, in art, in music, in almost any measure of civilizational achievement, those guys were on top. And Western civilization, then called Christendom, 
was a relative backwater. And the question is, how did this relatively inferior civilization accumulate so much economic and military and political power that by the 19th century, it was able to conquer all the other civilizations in the world put together? How did this happen? Now, the conventional answer, which is given by multiculturalism, is that Western civilization prevailed. It became rich and successful because it is oppressive. In this view, it is Western oppression, and specifically slavery and colonialism and imperialism that are the keys to Western affluence and Western power. The basic idea here is that the West became rich by beating up all the other guys and taking their stuff. And the question we have to ask is, is this true? The reason this matters is because this is the moral engine driving the reparations debate. The idea of reparations for slavery, reparations for colonialism. But this idea that the West got rich at the expense of everybody else is also at some level the bin Laden argument. The reason bin Laden can connect with the man in the Arab street is not because you've got US troops in Saudi Arabia, and fundamentally it's not even Israel. It's the simple notion that you are down because they are up. You are poor because they are rich. They have gotten rich at your expense. And so my question is, is this oppression theory valid? I begin by thinking about colonialism. I, interestingly, when one looks around the world historically, one realizes that there is nothing particularly Western about either slavery or colonialism. Both are universal institutions. Take colonialism. It is true that the British ruled my native country of India for a couple of hundred years, but long before the British, India was invaded and occupied by the Afghans, by the Persians, by the Mongols, by the Mughals, by the Turks, by the Arabs. By my count, the British were something like the seventh colonial power to invade India. There's nothing Western about colonialism. And interestingly, there is nothing particularly Western about slavery either. Slavery has existed in every known civilization. That the Chinese had it, the Indians had it, the Greeks and Romans had slavery, slavery was common all over Africa. American Indians had slaves long before Columbus set one foot on this continent. In fact, what is distinctively Western is not slavery, but abolition. The movement, the movement to end slavery, the movement to get rid of it, this is a distinctively Western notion. What I am saying is that there is no history of anti-slavery activism outside of Western civilization anywhere in the world ever. Now, don't get me wrong, in every slave society, slaves don't want to be slaves. And so we have runaways and slave revolts in every slave culture. But never in the history of the world outside the West has a group of people who are eligible not to be slaves, but slave owners mobilized against the institution of slavery. Think about what Abraham Lincoln said. He said, as I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. Now, Lincoln doesn't want to be a slave. We understand that. But interestingly, he doesn't want to be a master either. He rejects in principle the idea of slavery. He's willing to expend a lot of treasure and ultimately a lot of blood to get rid of it. I think all of this casts a new light, if I may say so, on the reparations debate. My, my own view of reparations was rather neatly summarized by, of all people, Muhammad Ali. Some of you will recall that in the 1970s, Muhammad Ali defeated George Foreman for the heavyweight title. They fought in the African nation of Zaire. It was somewhat insensitively called the rumble in the, in the jungle. Anyway, Ali emerges victorious, he returns to America, and as he gets off the plane, a reporter yells out, Champ, what did you think of Africa? And Ali replies, he says, um, thank God my granddaddy got on that boat. And 
film. Now, this is Ali being Ali, but I want to suggest that behind this quip, there is not only an accurate, but in some ways a quite profound observation. And to illustrate the observation, I want to say a word not about slavery, but about colonialism. When I was a young fellow growing up in Bombay, my grandfather, who had grown up under British colonialism, had developed as a consequence of it a kind of visceral hostility to the white man. And it was a, a sentiment, a vehemence, uh, that I didn't share. And as a child and as a young boy, it puzzled me. Why did my grandfather feel so strongly one way? Why did I feel a different way? And only years later, as I thought about it and read and mulled about it, reflected on it, that the answer finally came to me, and it came with a little bit of a surprise. I, reason, I realized that the reason my grandfather and I felt so differently was that if we were to tell the truth of it, colonialism had been pretty bad for him and pretty good for me. What I mean by this is that here was an institution that was harmful to the people who lived under it, but paradoxically it had proven to be beneficial to their descendants. Now, beneficial how? Well, here I am giving you a talk, and it is extremely significant that I'm giving you this talk in English. If I were to lapse into, let us say, Hindustani or native language Marathi, I'm sure I would clear out the room. I, I do my work on a computer. I'm a product of Western technology. A an Indian entrepreneur was recently quoted saying the computer industry in India will realize Gandhi's dream of wiping a tear off every Indian face. He might have been overstating, but this reflects the tremendous hope that India is investing in technology for its economic redemption. And then I look at my values. What do I believe in? I believe in individual dignity. I believe in the concept of universal human rights. I believe in democracy. I believe in innocent until proven guilty. These values are the product of Western civilization and no other. Now, colonialism was the transmission belt that brought these values to India. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that the colonialists came to India to give the Indians all this great stuff. They came, of course, to rule, and they ruled sometimes with a bit of a heavy hand. My, uh, my countryman Gandhi was uh, asked some decades ago, uh, what do you think of Western civilization? And he replied, he said, um, I think it would be a good idea. And this was a, a man chafing, chafing under the British yoke. But even though the British came to rule, in order to rule, they had to build some forts and some roads and some bridges and some railways. And they had to educate a native class of Indians to help administer the empire. And this meant they had to teach them English. And this meant that the Indians began to read Dickens and Jane Austen, and then, more significantly, Locke and Hobbes and Machiavelli and the Federalist Papers. And the Indians began to use new words that didn't exist in their traditional language, self-determination. And what I am saying is that the Indians learned the language of their liberation from their captors. Now, all of this is a way of saying that oppression is, in my view, a very weak explanation for Western success and Western affluence. And so if oppression doesn't explain how the West became rich and successful, what does? How did the West? prevail. In my view, the West prevailed by inventing three institutions that didn't exist before. And those three institutions are science, democracy, and capitalism. Now, all of these institutions are based on an impulse that is universal. And so, for example, consider science. People in every culture want to learn. The Chinese would record the eclipses, the Mayans developed the calendar, the Hindus invented the number zero, but science, by which I mean experimentation and verification and induction and criticism and what Whitehead has called the invention of invention, the scientific method, this is a Western idea. Or consider capitalism. In every society, people trade. 
there's nothing particularly Western about money, but capitalism, by which I mean property rights and contracts and courts to enforce them and ultimately joint stock companies and limited liability and insurance and double entry bookkeeping, the whole ensemble of practices that is called capitalism, this is a Western development. And the same is true of democracy. Tribal participation is universal, but democracy, by which I mean separation of powers and checks and balances and peaceful transitions of power and free elections, this is a Western idea. And it is the internal dynamic of these three institutions of science, democracy, and capitalism acting together that are the internal source of Western affluence and Western success. Now, I have focused to this point on Western civilization. I now want to talk about America. And the question I want to ask, I think, is a very relevant one today. What is it about the American idea that is simultaneously so attractive to so many people and yet so repellent to some? What is it about the American idea that magnetically draws immigrants from all over the world, that fascinates young people on every continent? But what is it about that same idea that is hateful, not just to fundamentalists in the Islamic world, but to many people in the United States? Now, to answer this question, I asked myself a little different question not long ago, namely, how would my own life have been different if I had never come to America, if I had stayed in, in India? And, and the reason I ask this question is because I've been reading the immigrant literature on America, and the immigrant literature on America is a Horatio Alger literature. Its basic theme is that people come to America for one reason alone, to get rich, to make money. And see, the critics of America like this explanation because it attributes the appeal of America solely to greed. And yet, in my view, this is a narrow and a partial and ultimately, I would say, even a distorted explanation of what is truly appealing and important about America. Now, there is a molecule of truth to it, and that's why this explanation has currency. Well, what is the molecule of truth? The molecule of truth is that more than any other country, America gives a very good life to the ordinary guy. Now, think about this. If you are a rich guy, you're going to live well anywhere. In fact, take my advice. If you are a rich guy, you are better off living outside of America. You know why? Because outside of America, you will enjoy something that you cannot buy in the United States, namely, the pleasure of aristocracy, the pleasure of being a superior human being. Now, what do I mean by this? C consider the example of Bill Gates. If Bill Gates were to walk the streets of America and stop people at random and say, listen, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you kiss both my feet, what would the typical American response be? The typical American response would be, Bill, go to hell. You, you, might have more, you might have more money than me, buddy, but you're not better than me. And so the point here is there is a deep-rooted social egalitarianism in America that limits what money can buy. So the rich guy lives, lives well everywhere. But America, I am so conscious as an immigrant, America gives almost a scandalously good life to the common man. Look, we live in a country where construction workers will walk into a coffee shop and spend four bucks for a non-fat latte. We live in a country where maids drive pretty nice cars. I was on a long airplane flight the other day, happened to be sitting next to a plumber taking his third wife to St. Kitts. It's a level of material well-being that you have never seen in history. A friend of mine has been trying to come to the United States from India for almost a decade. Poor fellow, can't get a visa. Finally, I said to him, why are you so eager to come to America? He said, because I really want to move to a country where the poor people are fat. <laughs> so, so this is the 
So this is the molecule of truth. The, the material explanation does have some credibility, but, but in my view, this material explanation is grossly inadequate. It doesn't capture the real appeal of America. And so I come back to this question, how would my life have been different if I had never come? Now, if I had never come to America, if I stayed in, in, in India, I would have spent my whole life within a five-mile radius of where I was born. I would undoubtedly have married a girl of my identical religious and socioeconomic background. Today, I would without a doubt be a doctor, an engineer like my dad, or a computer programmer. I would have a whole set of opinions that could be easily predicted in advance, and they would not be a lot different from what my dad believed or his father before him. And what I am saying is that my destiny would to a large degree have been given to me. I'm not saying I would have no choice, but the choice would be within narrow parameters. I'll give you an example. My, my sister got married a few years ago, and the way this happened is my parents conducted a, a semi-scientific survey of all the eligible families in our, our neighborhood. Uh, they had in a set of criteria, they looked at the socioeconomic status, the uh, social reputation of the family, the character and job of the boy in question, uh, rumors of a lunatic uncle, and they, they winnowed the list down to an approved few. And then those families were invited to our house for dinner with suspicious regularity. Now, my sister was, in, in the words of Milton Friedman, free to choose but free to choose within the approved group. Now, my sister knew about it. She consented, she chose, she's happily married, she has two children. I'm not quarreling with the outcome, but I am saying that her destiny was to a large degree choreographed by my parents. In America, by contrast, we get to write the script of our own life. In America, your life is like a blank sheet of paper and you are the artist. In America, your destiny is not given to you, it is constructed by you. And so if you say to your children, young Tommy, young Jane, what do you want to be? It is they and not you who supply the answer. So it seems to me that this notion of being the architect of one's own destiny, of being in the driver's seat of one's own life, is the huge idea that is behind the worldwide appeal of America. If you ask a young person anywhere in the world, you have two choices. Somebody else can plot out your life's path, or you can do it for yourself. It's not hard to see what young people will choose. So this, in my view, is the appeal of America. But now I want to say a word about what it is about this American idea that is so controversial so controversial, not just in the Islamic world, but also here at home. To answer this question, let me suggest that there has been a moral revolution in America since the 1960s, a revolution that has radicalized the meaning of freedom beyond anything the American founders conceived. The American founders believed in three types of freedom, economic freedom, political freedom, freedom of speech, and religion. But the American founders also believed that human nature is everywhere the same. People want the same things in life. And if you give them these three kinds of freedom, they will chart an American dream for themselves. But this notion of freedom was radicalized in America in the last few decades, and it, was, it has been radicalized along the lines of the philosopher Rousseau. Now, I'm not saying Rousseau caused the change but he articulates it, I think, with a special clarity and force. And here is what, in a nutshell, here is what Rousseau says. He says, there is a way of being human that is my way. There is a way for me to live my life that only I can decide for myself. And that if I am faced with a major decision, who to love, uh, whom to marry, what to become, what to believe. Rousseau says, I do not resolve that issue by consulting my parents or my teachers or my preachers, not even God. Well, how then do I decide? 
I decide by consulting my inner self. I consider myself to be a being with inner depths. I dig deep within myself. I look to that internal rudder inside of me to be my infallible guide about how to act and what to do and what to believe. In short, Rousseau is articulating the idea of authenticity, of being true to yourself. And this is a new and radical idea. Because to the American founders' list of freedoms, it adds a new freedom, which can be called inner freedom or moral freedom. And I want to suggest that this is the American idea that is hugely subversive in the Islamic world. Bin Laden said recently a very important statement. He said, Islam is facing the biggest threat it has faced since the days of Muhammad. Now, I think that's true. But how is it true? It's not true because of US troops in, in Mecca. It's not even true because of Israel. Israel is, from that point of view, a nuisance, an irritant, but it doesn't fundamentally threaten the existence of the Islamic world. But the Russoistic idea does because it supplies a rival source of allegiance to the authority of Allah. The idea of being true to the inner self, in a sense, says to the Islamic woman or even child, you don't have to listen to the male head of the household. You don't have to listen to the Sharia, the holy law. You don't have to listen to the mullahs. You don't even have to listen to Allah. All you have to do is follow the authority of your inner self. It is, as I say, a radical idea, and it is immensely controversial in America. It is the basis of the culture wars. The other day, I was in my um, uh, neighborhood Starbucks, and I happened to look across the counter, and there I saw a most interesting specimen who probably would not have existed in earlier generations. Uh, and as I surveyed him, his, his mohawk hair, his nose rings, his ear rings, his tattoos, his stubs, I could just imagine my former Washington colleague, Judge Bork, entering the room. I mean, his, his instinctive reaction would be something like, arrest that man. But, but if one were to go up to the Starbucks guy and say to him, uh, what are you trying to do? He would answer something like this. He would say, well, I am trying to be unique. I, I want to be me. I, I want to be an individual. Now, it could be pointed out to him that this is a very ineffective way to be unique, considering every fourth guy at Starbucks looks like that. But, but my point is that even, even in a somewhat debased form, what we are seeing is an attempt to live up to the idea of authenticity, the idea to live up to a life that counts, a life that is not a copy of somebody else's life. And I guess what I'm saying is that even though the ideal might be debased in its expression, it is not a debased ideal. It was Edmund Burke who said, um, to love our country, our country should be lovely. And what he means by this is that we all love our country because it is ours. But Burke is saying that is not the highest form of patriotism. The highest form of patriotism is based on loving your country not just because it is yours, but also because it is good. I think that's the question facing us today, is as we are called upon to make sacrifices for America and to have not just a momentary flag-waving enthusiasm in the aftermath of a terrorist attack, but an enduring patriotism, can we meet the Burkean test? And I, I believe that we can. I believe that we can end by saying that we can love our country because it is good. I want to leave you with a final thought. We cannot effectively answer the Islamic critique of America at its best by appealing to many of the things that we traditionally celebrate about America. I will often hear Americans say something like this, our civilization is better because we are prosperous, we are free, uh, we are pluralistic, we are tolerant, we extend rights to women. The most intelligent Islamic critics Admit all this, but dismiss it as worthless triviality. The Egyptian philosopher Saeed Qutb, for example, who came to America and lived here, he says, of course you are all those things, but who cares? Those are not the most important things to do. He says freedom is an important value, but it's not the highest value. 
He says the highest value is virtue. He says we in the Islamic world are trying to implement the will of God. Now we might be failing, but at least we're trying. And that makes our civilization morally superior to yours. And now the question is, how can we meet this Islamic critique on its own terms? In my view, the Islamic premise is in fact correct. Virtue is in fact the primary end of society, not liberty. However, I would like to suggest that liberty is the essential moral precondition for virtue. Liberty is needed to make virtue virtue. Imagine the case of a woman in Iran who is required to wear a veil. In my opinion, she is not modest. Why? Because she is being forced. You can only choose the good if you have the right to choose. It is only by choosing freely that you can exercise the choice for the good. And so it seems to me that this is, if you will, the conclusive argument. It is not just that America is more prosperous. We are that. Not just that we're more free. We are that. Not just that we extend rights to women. We do. But ultimately, we even have a moral superiority over Islamic civilization for the simple reason that a coerced virtue is no virtue at all. And thus, I think we can meet the Burkean test and love our country ultimately, not only because it is ours, but also because it is good. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
in, in, in What's So Great About America, in the new book, I, I, don't, I focus on the Islamic critique, but I also look at other critiques of America, uh, the left-wing critique of American foreign policy, uh, the culturally conservative critique of American culture. Uh, are we slouching towards Gomorrah? There seem to be some conservatives who say, America used to be a great country, but it isn't anymore. Um, and I try to look at all these different um, prongs of anti-Americanism that have the effect of sapping patriotism. Well, let's look for a moment at the anti-globalists. And the anti-globalists, I mean, really, I find them most amusing for this, for this reason. Um, you have these multinational companies that are employing people in Thailand and in Calcutta. And it is true the multinational corporations are paying people $5 a day. And those $5 a day guys are competing with American workers who make maybe $12 an hour. But what, what the, what the anti-globalists miss is that $5 a day is probably one and a half times the going rate in Calcutta. That's why you've got people lining around the block to work for Procter & Gamble or IBM. It's the best job available. Now, the Pat Buchanans of the world have, in some senses, a, a coherent position. We may not agree with it, but it is coherent. Basically, what Buchanan says is he says, listen, who cares about the Bangladeshi or the Calcutta or the Thai guy? I don't care about them. He says, I like the big hairy guy in Detroit making $12 an hour. I want to help the big hairy guy. I don't care about the little guy. I care about my guy. And there's a certain kind of tribal logic to this. I want to help my extended family. So, but Buchanan knows what he's saying. I think what is amusing to me is the anti-globalists say the same thing, impose tariffs, force American companies and multinational companies to pay the guy in Calcutta $12 an hour, impose conditions that would essentially make it prohibitive for the multinational company to go there in the first place. But the difference is that the anti-globalist says, I'm doing it for the guy in Calcutta. I'm helping that guy. Well, this is the hypocrisy that I find annoying. Is it's one thing, I, I can sort of have a grudging respect for the Buchananite position, which basically says, this is my man. I want to help the $12 guy. I don't care about the little guy. But what I don't get is the argument that claims the moral authority of helping the third world, fighting racism, curing poverty, global uplift, and so on, and then recommends policies that have the exact opposite effect. This is why you will not see a lot of guys from Calcutta marching in the demonstrations. If you were President Bush, what would you do to make America better? Well, um, in this connection, I think that Bush has been doing uh, a reasonably good job on the military side in fighting terrorism, but I think a weaker job on the intellectual side. This is extremely important for two reasons. Uh, one, I think Bush needs to give Americans better reasons or reminders for why they should love their country. But that's the smaller job. The bigger job is to make the case for America to the world, and specifically to the Muslim world. Why is this important? You might say, well, there's a bunch of terrorists. Well, it's important because even if you knock out all the terrorist networks, it still doesn't solve the problem of these so-called jihad factories. And by that, I mean all the religious schools and mosques that are putting out thousands, if not tens of thousands, of, 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 of jihad volunteers and, and would-be suicide bombers. Ultimately, you can't, cannot kill all those people. You have, to, you have to persuade them. And that means you have to make an argument that they can listen to. Now, let me say, it seems to me that there are two views of American freedom that are at stake here, and only one of them can make headway in the, in the Muslim world. The first view is freedom is a value in and of itself. That we don't really care how people use freedom, we value freedom for its own sake. In a sense, you can call it, that's the freedom to do as you damn well please. 
Now, that radical view of freedom, in a sense, is indifferent to the content of freedom. And if you said to such a person, what if 270 million Americans all want to live like Larry Flint? Would that mean America is a good country? And the logical answer would have to be yes, because they are choosing freely. But there is another view of freedom, no less libertarian, and this is a view of freedom that says, look, human nature has a good side, but it also has a dark side. Freedom will be used well, but many times freedom will be used badly. And that the moral case for freedom is not based upon the naive supposition that freedom will always be used well. It is based upon the belief that freedom is the necessary foundation for choosing the good. You cannot have virtue without freedom. This second argument, it seems to me, can make a lot of headway in the Islamic world. Now, it is a mistake to believe that in the Islamic world there is no notion of individualism or freedom. Islam has in common with Judaism and Christianity a central tenet, and that is that salvation only comes to the individual soul giving free assent to the idea of God. And so in Islam there is a kernel of freedom acknowledged as it was in Christianity primarily in the theological realm, but it seems to me that we have some uh, soil to till there, if you will, to make the case to the people in that part of the world that our society is not only a free society, but it is also aspiring to be a virtuous society. How does the average American answer the world's fear of American culture's growing prominence? The, um, the spread of American culture and by that I mean uh, the culture of movies, of television, Hollywood, and so on, um, I think we have to realize does give a, um, a little bit of a distorted picture of what America is like. Uh, I'll give you an example. You know, when I was growing up as a young boy in, in, in Bombay, on, on television we would have, um, basically we'd have I Love Lucy, um, World War II movies. Now my mom turns on television sitting uh, in her living room and it's it's a totally different fair. I mean, you've got you got the talk you got the talk show, and the, you know, there's a married couple, and the man has become a woman, and the woman has become a man, and the premise of the show is that their sex life is better than ever. And and to my mom, seeing this, you know, five thousand miles away, she says, you know, this is America. Now, uh, I have to try to convince her uh, that no, that is. That is American entertainment, and that the talk show is the modern equivalent of the circus. I mean, think about this. Fifty years ago, you went to the circus, what would you see? I mean, you'd see midgets, you'd see dwarves, freaks, and so on, and y you, can't, you can't have midgets and dwarves today, so you have moral dwarves. Uh, so. <laughs> So I think, I think the average American in some can make the case that distinguishes, if you will, America, the, the way we are, the way we live, which I think is defensible, and some of the wilder uh, portraits of American culture, which are not a true picture of the way we live. Where do you see India over the next 50 years? The, uh, in a sense, I've, um, you know, I, was, I came to America at the age of 16, and I haven't, uh, I've grown up here, and in a sense, my field, although I'm often asked to comment on India, my field of expertise is America. But in, in, in thinking about the new book, What's So Great About America, I've had to think comparatively. I've had to draw on my own experience about living in another culture. And the reason I do this is because the, the critics of America in judging America are using a utopian standard. They're comparing America to what? Not to any other existing society, but to the Garden of Eden. And it's not surprising that America falls a bit short. But I am comparing America to other existing cultures. Now, I will say that India and China seem to me to be 
positive examples, not positive on the whole, but positive in one respect, that these are ancient civilizations that have been left behind by Western modernity that are making efforts, if you will, to embrace modernity. Uh, look at the simple example of technology. You go to Silicon Valley, you see a lot of Indians and a lot of Chinese. These guys are trying, if you will, to become part and are making a genuine contribution. I think that the sad fact of, is that in the Islamic world, which was once no less, in fact, probably greater than those two civilizations, in the Islamic world you have nothing comparable. When is the last time you heard of a great Islamic discovery or invention? I mean, the only thing that part of the world produces now is oil and dead bodies. And the Islamic fundamentalists know this, and they are trying to come to terms with their contemporary irrelevance. In a sense, you can say that what they are, what they are doing is, is combining an awareness of economic and political and military and cultural inferiority with a belief in moral superiority. And it is that potent combination that is driving anti-Americanism uh, in, in, in the Muslim world. How does Western civilization correctly get freedom of choice into the Islamic world and maintain virtue? Samuel Huntington, the uh, political scientist, uh, spoke of a clash of civilizations. And um, this clash of civilizations is uh, not just a clash between us and them, it is also a clash of civilizations within the Muslim world. And what I mean by that is that in the Islamic world, including in places like Iran, there are two camps. There is the pro-Western camp, the liberal camp, the people who want science, democracy, capitalism, and then there is, if you will, the bin Laden camp, the fundamentalist camp. And uh, it seems to me that what we have seen in the last couple of decades is the fundamentalist camp has been rising and the liberal camp has been weakening. It is our job, if you ask, what is the goal of our foreign policy? It seems to me the long-term goal of our foreign policy is a very ambitious one. It is to turn Muslims into liberals. Now, of course, I don't mean we want to turn them into liberals of the Michael Dukakis stripe. I mean, that, that was probably too harsh even for bin Laden. Um, but what I mean is we want them to respect the idea of consent. Uh, and so, yes, our, our policy should be aimed at strengthening the liberal elements in the Islamic world against, against if you will, the, the fundamentalists. Who sponsored your speech, and can you tell us a little bit about them? My, uh, maybe I'll make this the last question. My speech um, is co-sponsored by by P, the Foundation for Economic Education, and I have the uh, privilege of um, uh, going on behalf of P and speaking on campuses. Uh, and an another group that I also speak on campuses a lot for, and that is the Young America's Foundation. Uh, the Young America's Foundation is one of the most active groups in sending speakers to campus, uh, and I enjoy, I probably speak 25, 30 times a year uh, crossing swords with professors and debating a whole, whole raft of characters. Um, let me say a final word, if I may, about, um, about what's great about America. Um, and that is, although America is the world's only superpower, it, it behaves in a manner that no superpower has ever behaved. Uh, consider this. This is a country that defeated Japan and Germany at the end of World War II and rebuilt those countries. I mean, this is a country that is an abstaining superpower. One of the pleasures of being a superpower and being the only superpower is you basically get to kick around and, and invade and tell other people what to do. That was kind of the point of being a superpower. But America shows very little interest in doing those things. It is, an, it is if you will, a superpower that doesn't really want to govern the rest of the world in the way that the British and the French and the Mongols and the others did. And finally, this is the only country I know of that goes to fight with other countries and in the middle of the fight starts dropping food to avert starvation on, among, among the civilians on the enemy side. I mean, what is this? I, I, don't, you know, I don't see 
Genghis Khan swarming across Asia and Europe, handing out bowls of Mongolian beef. So this is, um, this is American exceptionalism. Now, the critics of America are always judging America and judging it by a high standard. And it seems to me that this, in a way, unwittingly, they supply the ultimate argument for American moral superiority. And what is that? It is this. If any other country, let's say if the Chinese or the Arabs slaughter tomorrow 5,000 of their own people, what would the worldwide reaction be? The worldwide reaction would be to utter one long collective sigh and within 15 minutes return to our breakfast. Why? Because it is sadly true that we sort of expect the Chinese and the Arabs to do these things. But if America in the middle of a war accidentally bombs a hospital or a school and kills 150 people. It is an international incident. There is a global outrage. There are demonstrations. There are hearings. There is a, there is a big hubbub about it. And what does this prove but the fact that even the critics of America are holding America to a higher standard? And this is, if you will, the irrefutable evidence of American moral superiority. This is, if you will, one of the things that's great about America. Thank you very much. Dinesh D'Souza is a research scholar at the Hoover Institution. His books include The Virtue of Prosperity, A Liberal Education, The End of Racism, and his latest, What's So Great About America? It's published by Regnery on the web at regnery.com. Forty-eight hours of non-fiction books on TV. You're watching Book TV.